that we read, Romans 12, 15 through 21, contains some really radical, revolutionary teachings about relationships. And most of us need help when it comes to relationships, don't we? Yes. And within those 12, but within those verses, are eight relational remedies for your relationship ruptures. So you have no cards and pens as we go over these, just in case um, you have something you want to make a note of, because of, there's going to be questions at the end of each remedy. This is just for yourself privately to keep in case you want to take an action step and need a reminder. So. I got this off of some, his name is Bill Bryan, and I really, I really thought it was a nice presentation. And it's really about how can we learn to love those we'd rather hate. So number one, it we see in verse 15, is empathize with the emotions of others. And we know sympathy is when you feel for someone, it can be kind of condescending. Empathy is when you put yourself in their place and you feel what they're feeling. So it's very different. So we're invited to share both the blessings and burdens of others. And mourning usually means to weep, to cry. So we're rejoicing with the ones that are rejoicing and we're crying with people who are crying. But here's a question. Which is more difficult to do? To rejoice with those who rejoice or to weep with those who weep. And what if somebody you knew won the lottery and won a million bucks? Most of us would be, oh, great. And then it's like, oh, darn, I wish I'd put my money in. Or, oh, boy, I bet you they're going to change now. And, oh, maybe they're going to share the money a little bit. Or the, all kinds of things go through. And there's a little bit of envy there for most of us. And we should also admit that sometimes when someone has had a bad thing happen to them inside, we might be secretly thinking, well, maybe they deserved it. So in order to rejoice in someone else's joy, we need to get rid of all our jealousy and get rid of our judgmental spirit. And so instead of being indifferent to the emotions of others, we need to practice empathy and feel the feelings. And fellowship is more than a cup of coffee and a cookie. It means sharing burdens and blessings. So there's a story about this little boy who had a big heart. And his next door neighbor was an elderly gentleman whose wife had just died. And the little boy saw him in the yard and went out to the yard and sat with him and then climbed into his lap and just sat there with him and held him. And later his mother said, well, what did you have to say with our neighbor? And he said, nothing. I just helped him cry. And sometimes that's what empathy is. So to refuse to rejoice with another reveals envy in our hearts. To refuse to weep with another reveals a lack of compassion in our heart. Either way, there's a serious problem. So here's the question for your card. Is there anyone you can help cry? Is there anyone you need to rejoice with lately? Okay, and the second one is seek harmony with humility. And this is really the only way to enter into the emotions of another person. So the verse Romans 12, 16, live in harmony with one another, do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. And I thought, hmm, when I first read that. But Greek for harmony really means think the same things towards each other. Share the feelings, empathy. And low position means people who have been flattened by life. And who in this room hasn't been pummeled and flattened in our life one time or another? So there are many people in our communities that have been flattened by life. And it's not until you walk in somebody else's shoes, learn their story, or walk in their moccasins, as the wise Indian saying goes, that you really know what their life has been. 
And after you do that, you might really have the highest of admiration for somebody that you thought completely different of before. And when Ron and I used to come out here when my mom was alive and visit, I would give talks on acupuncture because I was trying to build my practice for when I got out here. And I'd go to different groups. And there was one group I went to called the Mystic Mamas, a group of women who studied alternative medicine, various religious practices, different ethnic groups. And they got a bad name in town because uh, on a Wednesday night, which is when they met, which was church night, no, 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 they uh, did an Indian house blessing where they walked around somebody's house doing the Indian chant that was a blessing, throwing cornmeal. And a neighbor saw them, and of course she wasn't at church either on church night, but she spread all around, all around town that they were witches. Oh. And uh, heightened that. I heard actually this year from somebody that's on the museum, the museum committee with us about this group that meets in graveyards. Well, they don't even meet anymore. And they did gravestone rubbings. So, you know how gossip, gossip goes in a small town. But as I got to know these women and attended the programs that they had when they still had them, I really realized how flattened their lives had been. And I was kind of told, don't want to hang out with them because, you know, their kids are a mess, they're not good mothers, they don't have husbands, or their husbands are a mess. But I wondered how I would be today if I had a father who was an alcoholic that beat us regularly and then left. How would I be today if my mother had been misprescribed psych drugs and ended up being institutionalized? How would I be today if somebody had abandoned me out in the country with eight kids 50 miles from town with no parents for a week. How would I have turned out if these things happened to me? And I realized these women are heroes and I truly admire and respect what they have become in spite of all their flattening experiences. So, question is, do you have a habit of being judgmental? Has it been a while since you've gotten off your high horse? Are you living in harmony with those around you? Or is there someone's name you need to put on your card of whose moccasins you need to walk in for a little while? The third one is resist repaying a wrong. This is verse 17. It's a warning against what comes naturally to most of us. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. So don't pay back a wrong that's done to you. So, why? Because it caused conflict to escalate. It's usually excessive, it's never the same, and it always, it's always payback with interest when it comes back and forth. And it also runs our witness of Christ. It creates ugly, evil emotions and states within us that we'd rather not have. Um, and Dr. Victoria Moots is one of the best examples I have of this scripture. She bought... Um, rest home, a vacant rest home in Kingman, to turn into a rehab center with a pool and everything. And she put a lot of her own money into it, and she started, started an architect and got the plans, and she started getting other people interested, and they were investing. Then they found out that the financial manager had embezzled all the funds, somebody out of Kansas City. So, that was the end of that project. And Dr. Moose worked for a couple years without pay in her clinic to make sure that the clinic ran, had supplies, and the people who worked there had their regular salaries. Uh, she didn't uh, prosecute the man. She forgave him. And I thought, oh, Dr. Moots. But she was really a smart woman, and she's very Christian. Because she kept her focus on her mission, which is healing people. I know another incident of, I had a friend, an acupuncturist, who has a very successful practice in a very status town in Massachusetts, and his wife had stage four cancer, was going for all the treatments, so he had to hire someone to take over his business so he could be with her. And so he did, and it ends up the classmate that he hired embezzled from his practice. So he decided to prosecute. So the sad thing about this was that all the time his wife 
was very ill, and they also had a child too. He was going through all the things you have to do to actually prosecute somebody, looking through all the records, getting witnesses, blah, 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 getting all this stuff for the lawyers. So that's where his mind was. His wife died, and he didn't have that time with her, and his practice suffered, and to this day, he's still suffering from that decision he made. So, sometimes forgiveness is the best payback you can have. So, the question on the card is, is there someone you'd like to pay back today? Do you want someone to hurt like you've been hurt? Then here's the deal. Don't retaliate when you've been wrong. Because this is what you give up to God. We can give it up to God just like we turn everything else over to Him and He'll take care of it. And we don't have to. So we don't have to feel those emotions. God will take care of it. C.S. Lewis hit it on the head when he said, everyone says forgiveness is a lovely idea until they have something to forgive. And for country music fans, Garth Brooks has a song with these lyrics. We bury the hatchet, but we leave the handle sticking out. We're always digging up things lest we should forget about. So forgiveness is hard because it demands something that we really value, the right to repay. But Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13, 5 says, love keeps no records of wrongs. So just give it up to God and let him take care of it. So, question, who do you need to let go of right now? Okay, the fourth is the last part of verse 17. Be careful to do what's right in the eyes of everyone. And so this is easy to misunderstand. It doesn't mean you have to please everybody. It's not our job to make everyone happy, and we have to remember that. But it's sticking to our values, our Christian values, and leading lives as we know we should, doing what's right. Because in taking the thought to do this beforehand, and there's that question, what would JC do? You can ask in a situation. So sometimes in emotion we get haphazard and we shoot from the hip when God wants us to be prepared to walk in his ways. So the word right here means beautiful or precious or godly. And when we ponder how to do what is precious or godly, and we do it, then people will notice that and give him glory. And I have an example of this in my new career as a nurse. And you know how, if you've been in healthcare, you know the healthcare workers and the overburdening and the turmoil and the emergencies and overwhelming times, <coughs> a lot of times they have to discharge. Some people do this with macabre jokes, with bitching, complaining, letting off steam in a variety of ways. And then there's Anna, this woman that I work with. She is so kind, she never says a bad word, she never bitches or complains about a per patient. Uh, she does her work tirelessly with such heart and compassion and perfection. It's like, I asked her one night, and I said, Anna, how can you do this work the way you do? And she said, God. And I said, wow. And so, Anna does what's right. And the question is, think of a situation you need to handle. Are you, rehearsing, are you rehearsing the right thing to do before you even get into it? Do you have a premeditated plan in place? Or are you just going to wing it? How can you pre prepare yourself today for what you'll face tomorrow? That's what doing right is. And five is be at peace if possible. I really like this. This answered for me. If it is possible, this is what verse 18 challenges us to be peacemakers. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. It's really 
realistic because it makes peace seem attainable. And the key to do is everything you can do to be at peace with everyone. As far as it depends on you. So here are some questions when it comes to ponder what it means to be a peacemaker. Have you accepted your part in the breakdown of peace? And again, I'm taking, you can take this on a local level, you can take it on a work level, you can take it on a family level, so it's real. Are you willing to make wrongs, right, make right the wrongs that you may have done? Have you forgiven any wrong that has been done to you? Are you doing your part to be at peace? And here's another good thing. If the other person refuses to be reconciled, there's not much you can do about it. And this is really good advice. My response is my responsibility, and the only person I can change is me. You can make the effort, but you can only change yourself. We will not answer for the other individual, we answer for ourselves. And the sixth remedy, relinquish revenge to God. When we're hurt, we often want to hurt the one who hurt us. But verse 19 calls us to live differently. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge, I will repay, says the Lord. Again, this is let God handle it, with good reasons. God alone can judge fairly. We don't know all the variables. We can't measure anyone else's heart. He maintains a moral order, not us. No one's going to get away with anything. God will make sure that justice is done in his way and in his time. And the God of judgment is also the God of mercy. Aren't we glad that God is merciful and gracious towards us? So think about it. The person you're angry with right now may repent and seek re re reconciliation and might become a different person. Just as God has extended mercy to us, he might extend it to others. And there's a story in the Bible about David when King Saul was seeking to destroy him. David's being hunted down like an animal, through no fault of his own. He tries to stay out of Saul's way, but it's pretty impossible because he's persistently being persecuted. And on two different occasions, David had a chance to do Saul in and destroy him. But he chose to honor and respect Saul because he believed God put Saul in power as a king. It would be God who would have to remove him from power. And so this is what David declares in Samuel 24, 6. The Lord forbid that I should do such a thing to my master, the Lord's anointed, or lift my hand against him, for he is anointed of the Lord. When Saul then realized that David had spared him, he was initially very moved by this act of mercy. And he said, when a man finds his enemy, does he let him get away and harm? May the Lord reward you for the way you treated me today. And of course, then Saul went ahead and been bad, but then God took care of Saul when he was later filleted by the Philistines. So God will take care of things. So instead of seeking revenge, we're to look for ways to point those who persecute us to reconciliation. So the question is, is there a situation in your life which you need to move away from revenge right now? Is it time to love them and leave them in the hand of God? And the seventh one is to do good to those who do you wrong. Christ followers are called to this countercultural, contrary response to people who wrong us. And this is verse 20. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will keep burning coals on his head. So Christianity goes beyond non-resistance to active benevolence. It doesn't destroy its enemies by violence, but converts them with love. So another biblical example of this is in uh, the time of Elisha in 2 Kings 6, 23 I don't know if I'm pronouncing this right. King Aram and his army decided to, decided to eliminate Elisha. When Elisha had the opportunity to wipe them all out, he instead fixed them a banquet, throws them a party, gives them food, and then sends them home. It would be like us gathering members of the Taliban or Al-Qaeda or Syrian President Bashar Assad's regime and 
having a little dinner for him after church today. Do not kill them, he answered. Would you kill men you have captured with your own sword or bow? Set food and water before them so, you may eat and drink and, so they may eat and drink and then go back to their master. So he prepared a feast for them, and after they had finished eating and drinking, he sent them away, and they returned to their master. So the bands from Aram stopped raiding Israel's territory. Kindness doesn't always mean that the person you offended will change. However, those watching your actions may be changed. Your children may be changed. And beyond a doubt, you will change as your bitterness and resentment are lifted. And so what does this heaping coals on his head mean? And so there were three different things I found about this. There's an Egyptian custom where people would heap coals on top of their head as a sign of repentance. Could be that. Or there's a practice of people carrying, in primitive cultures, carrying live fire on their heads from place to place as the nomads as they traveled. So they'd always have their briquettes to start the next fire. Uh, so it would keep the fires burning. And there's another representation that something extremely painful would lead the individual to remorse and repentance. But an act of kindness which brings about a burning shame will melt a rebellious heart. The idea is to respond generously with conspiracy of kindness so that your enemy will be ashamed of their actions. And the last one, eight, overcome evil with good. Verse 21 is really the summary of the whole chapter. Do not overcome, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And we forget that our aim is not to defeat those that we disagree with, but to win them with our actions and with the gospel. The cause of Christ is not advanced by doing evil. Bombing abortion clinics is wrong. Being filled with hatred toward homosexuals is wrong. Being constantly angry and vengeful toward those in another political party is not right. So here's something to think about. As long as you're trying to get even, you're still living in the past. Something may have happened years ago, but you're still stewing about it. So when you try to get even, evil destroys you because the other person keeps on winning. He or she is still controlling your life if you're obsessing about, about it. The only way to get free of your past is to let it go once and for all. And if you think about it, your enemy has won twice. Once when they hurt you, and then forever because you're still obsessing about it. So the whole idea is just give it up to God. And when someone is angry at you, the best response is not to retaliate, but instead to respond softly. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. And Martin Luther King really said it. He said, I've decided to stick with love because hate is too big a burden to bear. And another commentator captured it when he said, we are disciples of him who died for his enemies. Remember, none of us would be Christians if Christ hadn't loved his enemies and overcome our evil with his great good his death and resurrection. So Jesus is our example and our motivation. How do we show real love to the ones we hate? Do it by looking to Jesus, who showed real love to us. So to summarize these eight relational remedies of our relational ruptures that are found in those scriptures, one, empathize with the emotion of others. Two, seek harmony through humility. Three, resist paying a wrong. Four, realize that it's always right to do what's right, and we know what's right. Five, be at peace if possible. Six, relinquish revenge to God. Seven, do good to those who do you wrong. And eight, overcome evil by doing good. So here's two action steps that you might want to play with this week. Make an attitude adjustment by asking yourself these two questions. Do you, want, do you want your enemy to repent and become a different person and know God's kindness and forgiveness? Or do you want them to rose slowly over a spit in hell?
Men, take a step this week to do something kind towards the person you're struggling with. It could be a kind word, a phone call, an email, a note on Facebook, a flower, a meal, small gift, vanilla shake. Your limit is your own creativity. So use your card and just see what happens this week.